This is Judith Simon Prager. I've developed verbal first aid, and you are watching Facets Television. I'm Tim Jamal, president of the Board of Trustees of the South Orange County Community College District, and you are watching Facets Television. <laughs> You're back with Facets Television. I'm Kevin McDonald, and tonight with me is Ross Brodsky, the COO of ICS Software, but more importantly, one of our resident hackers. Thank you so much for coming in, Ross. Nice to be here. Some really interesting stuff going on in the world today. Every week. Every week. So what I want to start with, because it's probably the most important story of, the, of my career that mm -hmm. I've seen anyway, if it turns out to ultimately be real, is the hack of the NSA. Um, for those of you that don't know, apparently, Someone got into the NSA systems and took some software that was apparently some very valuable hacking tools, correct? Yes. And um, now Ross is going to tell us a little bit about what he thinks that is. So what do you think really happened? Uh, well, I, I don't have exact information that I can speculate, and we can talk about it right. all, all day long. But right. uh, there's definitely some exploits out there, like they were described in the articles, and they could be very valuable because they could penetrate firewalls and let you be unnoticed within a, you know, in a system for five years. Uh, things that no antivirus would pick up for a very long time if indeed those kind of tools were picked up. Okay. Now, I think that uh, what is very hard to know if those actual zero-day exploits uh, are, are still valid and uh, the people that claim to have them actually have them. So that's big unknown, but assuming that they're valid, mm -hmm. it's very, very valuable tools. So, you know, so let, let me kind of try to imagine here. Somebody has stolen what could be country-ending software, right, if they use them for the wrong things. How would you go about the transaction of buying something like that? A oh, very interesting question. So uh, there's many, many layers to this onion, how you structure transaction of buying something like this. So you, mm -hmm. you definitely putting yourself at risk, uh, you know, trying to sell it. Uh, the, the shadow broker is asking for Bitcoin, okay. uh, which is very strange in this level of transaction because it's very traceable. Yeah. Uh, and they're asking for, that's what the most strange about And this. potentially cancelable too. No, well. If you did it right. If you did it right, right, I don't know about that. You just break the blockchain, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but essentially, Bitcoin is traceable. And uh, the end point, I mean, we, we know a lot about that. And a lot of, there'll be a lot of eyes wanting to revenge, oh, you know, yeah, potentially. So uh, the way you, you know, there's a lot of things you can do to protect your identity, and it'll be harder to find you than Osama Bin Laden uh, online. And yeah. you know, the exchange of funds could happen very easily uh, these days, especially with Bitcoin. But uh, the people that they are upset potentially and doing transaction with Bitcoin is a little strange. Yeah. So for those that don't understand um, generally the technology, the idea is that you create software. Um, think of it as a tool that goes through the defenses of a network. Um, when he says the word zero day, what that means is that no one has come up with a hash or an identifier that allows us to stop that action or whatever that code is. Um, it sounds like, if this is true, they got some really gnarly stuff because the NSA, of course, has the backing of our federal government and lots of money and some good talent. Right? Yeah. Just not good enough to stop people from getting into their own network, apparently. Right. So, <laughs> so let's talk about that. Um, how would you imagine something, like not being, like you said, you don't know specifically, but how would you imagine someone getting into a system as complex? Would it be a phishing exercise? Would it be someone inside opening a yeah. door? It had to be our most likely scenario for this. Uh, it was a subcontractor yeah. uh, that had used similar encryption. So there is some, uh, some identifying elements there that points to that was stolen from a subcontractor. Okay. Uh, maybe a different facility, maybe uh, a device that was penetrated or lost. The, you know, uh, at all the most interesting security breaches uh, we hear about, it was somebody didn't uh, you know, put a checkbox somewhere and didn't follow through. Security is a way of life. If you want to have a real com secure system, it's a religion. You have to live it. Yep. You have to live it. Yep. So someone's, even though they're in security industry and they're experts, uh, then follow some procedure and 
uh, uh, here in Behold, that something that happened. How they get leaked, I don't think, no hackers typically uh, try to break the front door. So uh, email spear phishing attack is the most common. Yeah. Usually you don't get hackers this way. Uh, usually something like this would be an inside job. Yeah, that's uh, what I, my, my brain immediately went to someone on the inside. Yeah. It's too big. Um, and, and any type of data loss protection would, would stop you from attaching to a file like that without, you know, if it weren't someone inside with the right to do it, right? Uh, true. And then, but the other thing you, you, uh, I would like to mention, you don't know how they source these in the first place, right? right? So maybe I can, I can shed some light on that. So there's a company widely known in some circles called Wupen Group, yeah. right? They've been a broker of exploits for the last six years, if I my memory is right. They've been around for a while, and th that's what they do. They, they buy exploits, and they, they set the market for them. They're actually a market maker. Mm -hmm. uh, so this kind of sheds light on the whole market for exploits. Uh, and some articles say that NSA have been uh, secretly buying the exploits for a very long time. If they buy from, from, from a, whatever source is, and maybe uh, almost a market yeah. for them, um, Kevin Mitnick has a market for exploits. Yeah. Uh, it, there's a certain level of trust that you have to have to be on that market, to be a buyer seller. So you, not just anybody could be. And there's a, it's very difficult to sell in that market. And um, we honestly thought about uh, competing in that market as well because we own some exploits. We, we bought some exploits. We discovered some exploits mm -hmm. for what we do. We thought that maybe we can sell one and then maybe buy more. Uh, to get into that market, it's very cumbersome. Yeah. So, so let's, let's look at the, the potential impact here. Um, right. For those of you that don't know, you know, hear the, the problem, there's some, the term called Digital D-Day. And I actually wrote my first article on this back mm -hmm. in 2005 before it was in vogue. But the idea is that foreign countries get a hold of our infrastructure, our water, our power, our gas, our food distribution, all of those things. What is required to do that is to have access to systems to control them, whether they're uh, industrial controls or SCADA, which is supervisory control and data acquisition, and a variety of other things. All of those can be accessed through system controls using these types of exploits. But they can also get into our corporations that design our, our weapon systems and uh, all of the other important things. So this is a bad thing if this happened. Yes, and then depending on the level of exploits, how fresh they are. Some exploits uh, live, their lifetime is a week. Right. Uh, some exploits could live for five years. So uh, those exploits were from 2013, so they're, they're probably very recent. Yeah. Uh, and if they're valid, uh, the potential abuse and you know, proper use of the exploits is you know, using them on the firewall could penetrate through millions of firewalls, uh, potentially. So yeah. how soon the industry will deliver a patch for them that's a big question because nobody knows what that is, and you know, it, it took geniuses years to just to develop those yeah. exploits. Yeah, and so this is like having a master key to every firewall system or or to many of the firewalls, of the in, firewalls. in in the world. So um, one of the things I wanted to chat about too, mm -hmm. and I don't assume because of your position in the in the industry that that you may agree with me or not, but. I frankly think any American who sells an exploit to a foreign mm -hmm. country should be charged with treason myself, because what you're doing is setting us up for potential attack in the future. Um, so uh, you know. Usually, uh, you, okay, so you selling an exploit to someone without clearance is already a crime. I right. don't know if treason or not. Yeah. Uh, so you can only sell an exploit to someone with clearance right. to, properly. So uh, we can buy an exploit, and the current exploit markets, the, the, uh, the white markets, the, you know, the white side of the it. The public side. Public, yeah. well, they're never public. Well, no, I mean public meaning it's, it isn't in the dark web going on. You know, it's out, it's out in the real world. I'm not talking about that. Microsoft buying their own zero I get things, that. Right? No, I know exactly what but you're But the speaking. intelligence community buying those exploits, yeah. and they, they will provide their credentials. Yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. you selling it to intelligence community, and you, you, there's nothing that forbids you right now. Where but if, if I sold it to a foreign country, who, well, wouldn't that be, I mean, violation of ITAR is all by itself, right? Yeah, you're selling a weapon. Yeah, right? so exactly. It's, yeah. It needs to be treated like a weapon. Uh, and, and, Fundamentally and agree. Some countries treat it as a nuclear weapon. Yeah. Uh, so at it the same be. level, right? So yeah. it could have major damaging effect. Yeah. Very, so. very important. Well, I, I want to thank you for coming, but I also want to mm -hmm. give you the opportunity to um, talk about, now you are actually creating tools like the one of the tools that we're talking about potentially, correct? Correct. So we're creating an uh, offensive tool and, and a defensive tool and a tool for bail bond industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, 
And what's interesting to me, uh, the amount of money they're asking for the set of tools. And we would love to take a look at those, but we don't have this kind of money. Half but a billion dollars. Half a billion dollars. Yeah. Uh, but it kind of tells you how valuable they are in the right hands or wrong yeah. hands. But, yeah. you know, God forbid something will happen. Well, it's true. I mean, you could steal all the Bitcoin if you want. I mean, really, that's, that's the sad part about the thing about technology today is really is the equivalent of your vault, you know. Your intellectual property, if, if you have... Uh, designs or inventions and they haven't been seen by the public yet it's cl it's literally the value of your organization can be taken away in seconds we had many of our most sensitive weapon systems here in the United States stolen some years ago they're now building identical systems in China and in foreign countries that say they never took them but they're flying our airplanes so yeah. so this is why it's so important to have people like this on the defense Ross thank you so much thank for coming you that be I appreciate here. it very much I am Kevin McDonald, and you've been watching Facets Television. With us tonight has been Ross Brodsky with ICS Software, and thank you so much for watching. Welcome to Facets Television. I'm Kevin McDonald, and with us tonight is Timothy Jamal. Tim is the president of the South Orange County Community College District. He is the founder and president of the Jamal Public Affairs Organization, a member of the board of directors for the Morris Foundation. Tim also comes with a degree from Michigan State University in international relations and a master's degree from George Washington State University in international business. Thank you so much for coming in today. I Thank you, Kevin, for having me. In. So for those that don't know, Tim actually was on our show four years ago, and he was running for the community college district. So I'm really happy to see you have successfully now come, come four years into your uh, seat on that a district, and now you're running unopposed, I hear. I am. Uh, I, I guess I'm very fortunate that no one decided to uh, challenge me, although I was prepared to be challenged, and mm -hmm. I've worked hard over the last four years, and uh, will continue to do so, hopefully, for the next four years. It's been an interesting uh, uh, tenure here since I was elected in 2012. Mm -hmm. Last year, my colleagues on the board, the six others, had enough trust in me and they elected me president of the board of trustees so I started in uh, January of 2016. That's fantastic so you've had four years you're running unopposed now so let's talk more rather than about the campaign because there isn't going to be one which is awesome. Um, let's talk about what you've done for the last four years. If you had to pick a crowning achievement for the board and yourself over the last four years pick a couple for me if you can give me an idea of what you've done. Well there's two that really stand out to me. Over the last four years 30,000 students at Saddleback College and Irvine Valley College have been awarded, awarded either a degree or certificate. That's pretty substantial mm -hmm. because those students are either going to go on to a four-year degree or they're going to gain uh, employment in, in the workforce today. Mm -hmm. 30,000 over the last four years. That's a lot. And then the other I would say accomplishment since I became a uh, trustee was 24,000 students have either tran have transferred to a four-year university, mostly to the U a UC campus or the CSU campuses, but some to private institutions. Mm -hmm. So 54,000 students have been awarded a degree, a certificate, or transferred to a four-year university. So, there's so we're doing of, what we're supposed to do. So there's a lot of conversation right now about college education being based on the standards of the old way of living, making a living, whether you work in a factory or you work in some organized white blue collar um, white collar job how are we going to break that pattern and start to get more innovative and stop producing people that are you know in the box is is your district in in that process now or well absolutely I mean I, I think that one of the things that community colleges Kevin still offer students a second chance mm -hmm. because I think there is a, a belief among some students and parents that their student immediately after or their child after graduate from high school has to go on to a four-year university mm -hmm. now for some students that might be the right thing to do whether it's a research university or an engineering oriented college like a, a Harvey Mudd or a liberal arts college um, that's not the case if you you can elect to go to a community college to figure things out do you want to join the workforce and if you do there are a number of certificate programs that get you employment right away. Like yeah. at Saddleback College, for example, automotive, automotive technology program. Yeah. There are good starting salaries in automotive technology. There's a beauty college also that is affiliated with Saddleback College. And then at Irvine Valley College, we have advanced manufacturing where you don't always need a four-year degree to work. You know a little about yeah, manufacturing. Yeah, I'm in computers. Well, I'm in I mean, computers, and degrees are 
important when you're doing design and, and new chip Correct. inventions, but when you're in the technology services industry, that's not quite true. It's not quite true. In fact, there's a company in Irvine <coughs> that's still doing manufacturing called Astronix. You may yeah. be familiar with the I company, am. and they yeah. do instrumentation, testing of instruments, high-level instruments. Mm -hmm. And they have a, happen to have a workforce that's aging a little bit, and I know that the successor employees to those who may be retiring, <coughs> they don't need to have four-year degrees. They need to have the skill set to um, help develop and uh, not develop but manufacture and assemble the parts that go into yeah. the testing instruments. There's quite a substantial savings too. Both of my kids went community college first and then on to uh, whatever their degree was. My one daughter's going into nursing. My other daughter went to Brandman after she went to That's uh, the local college. So it saved us and frankly as a family probably fifty or sixty thousand dollars and they still got a really good quality education. So from your perspective um, one, what, do, what does the district need from the taxpayer, the, the, or the community, um, in order to continue to function, or even to better, better than that? How do we move to that next level? Well, I think there are <coughs> the community is already doing it. And so mo for our district, the overwhelming majority of our revenues come from local property taxes, and we thank the taxpayers for doing that, because that's, without that support, we wouldn't be able to exist as a community college. Mm -hmm. I think the second part um, is the third accomplishment I didn't mention was scholarships. So. That's one area where four-year universities and the UCs in particular are, are much further ahead. Even though over the last four years, we've awarded $4.1 million in scholarships to students at IVC or Saddleback, there's still a greater need. Mm -hmm. And um, because of the alumni connection to four-year universities through athletics and other programs, there tends to be more donations to the uh, advancement funds of, of, of the four-year universities. So that's really an area where um, if you're an alumni of, uh, of Saddleback College or Irvine Valley College, or you're a parent of a student who went there, the way you can contribute is to our foundations. Mm -hmm. And that really, even though it is a good buy, you know that. I mean, yeah. you saved a lot of money sure. sending it's your children to community college. Yeah. But still, um, it's still anywhere between you know, five to eight thousand dollars a year, and not every every family or every student can afford that. Yeah, so the we scholarships. Pay out of pocket, so yeah. So yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so that's where I think the community can really step up. So let me ask not to put pressure on you, but I, heard, I hear that uh, SAUSD just offered one year of free college. If you go from their SAUSD school to, N to Santa Ana College, um, I don't know if you heard about that. That's kind talking of about, he's ta I think you're talking about the offer from, I think, Rancho Santiago Community College District or Santa Ana College to receive students Santa from college. Santa Ana Unified, K-12. through Yeah, for one um, year of I mean, tuition free, yeah. Uh, how are they doing that? Do you know if they're doing that under a foundation or are they? I don't know if it's coming under the general fund or it's coming under foundation funding. Mm -hmm. Interesting um, stuff. I applaud them for doing it if they're able to do it. Um, you know, we're, it's not something that we're uh, inherently opposed to. I think something I think that we would be willing to consider. Right. I think one of the things, though, as, as you'll appreciate, I know the community appreciates, is we're debt-free as a district. Right. We've had, since I've been on the board, we've had four years of balanced budgets. We're building new facilities and capital projects without debt. And That's an so, amazing thing for a public uh, organization like yours. And it, it is, and it's really important to all of us, and we're, we're doing a groundbreaking for the new sciences building at Saddleback College next month. It's going to open, So I let's think, talk about that. Let's not worry about yeah. when it's going to open. What's it going to do? <laughs> what, well, it's gonna, we're going to just expand our classroom space and lab space so that students can pursue their interest in, in either uh, f uh, further education in sciences or go on to work. In, in the field of science. So That's great because I know that one of the problems I've seen in several of the schools is a resource. So they might have the students that nursing is a classic example. It is almost impossible to get into a nursing program around in, in this county. Uh, it's lottery. Yeah. My daughter went all the way to Oregon um, to get into She didn't have to do school. that. She could have yeah. gone to Saddleback. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> a particular program she was looking for, but the bottom line is even then it's still difficult to get into the schools here because of the, um, the lottery impacted. of competition, too much, not, not enough space, not enough opportunity. Um, what's the biggest challenge that the district has that, you, that, you're, that you're facing on a daily basis? It sounds like you've got some really good stuff going on, but yeah. there's always challenges. Well, Where are they? I, mean, I, I think one of the challenges is really to, to connect what we're doing even better to what's happening in business, in, in, the, in the local business community. Okay. And because I think on the, when you look at the transfer rates to four-year universities, we're doing very well. And we can't let that slip. Irvine Valley College is number one in the state. Saddleback College is in the top ten in the state. Mm -hmm. Ir Irvine Valley is number two in the state, number one in the state. That's pretty amazing. In terms of a transfer. Yeah, yeah. There's, 
there's 73 community colleges. So that says a lot about the call of the education because in order to get that transfer, you have to have decent grades. You have to right. have been able to pass the entrance exams and all the so other I, stuff. Right? Excuse me. There's 113 community colleges in the state. Irvine Valley College is number two in transferring to four-year universities. Talbot right, College is, stuff, yeah. is, is, is in the top ten. So the challenge is, okay, we're doing well on the transfer front. How do we, to your earlier point, to a student who may not go into a four-year university or may not go into a graduate school, how do we better connect our certificate, our, our uh, uh, career technical education programs, used to call vocational, right. how do we better connect what they're doing where the in-demand jobs are locally. So I'd like to talk about that for just a second, really quickly. This is a really important point in life. A lot of people say if you push someone into vocation because they're good at it, they're good with their hands, they're mechanical, they, they understand computers, games, whatever it is, it is silly to me that this country has gotten to the point where those highly paid skills, highly sought after skills, are being poo-pooed by people that want kids to have degrees that don't pay. So let's focus on where the kids can make a good living, okay? I mean, right. seriously. Well, I'm so, just look at the average. I mean, when you, you know, I know you and I are getting grayer, a little older, but yeah. manufacturing isn't what it used to be. No. These are very Certainly clean not. rooms. Yeah. These are clean spaces. They're not smokestack industries. Yep. You look at the manufacturing that takes place here in Orange County, the company I mentioned, Astronics, there are others. I mean, these are amazing facilities. And I know guys in tech that are 24, <laughs> 25 years old making 130, $170,000 a year with right. a two-year certificate or less, right? So, so I'm with you, and I like the idea of transfer because we need those masters, we need those PhDs, we need those people. We but we don't want to push everybody down that road because there just isn't enough room for them. So in the last minute that we have, first of all, thanks for coming in. I want to give you an opportunity to... To, um, if you have a request or a statement that you want to make to the public, this is an opportunity for you. Well, I think uh, a couple of things. One, um, there's pretty exciting news in South Orange County um, in terms of what we're going to do in the next couple of years. We plan to build a, a stadium at Saddleback College. Oh. And this is um, up to a 10,000 seat stadium, nice. state of the art uh, for that size. And I debt think it's free. Be debt free. <laughs> um, we're going to do it based upon our, our ability to pay um, on our revenues without taking out any debt. And so this will allow us to attract, do major sporting events, help better, uh, get better recruits yeah. that want to play at a community college and also have hold events for local high school games, local CIF playoff games. So it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing um, in North County, I think Coast Community College District has a stadium, but in South County, there's nothing like it. So we're moving forward with that. That's a big step, and that will likely uh, will break ground within the next year or two. On that project, well, so, thank you so much like the community involved with that. Well, well, I'd like to keep an invitation open. Maybe if you, as you get forward on on some of those programs, and you want to talk a little bit more about them, educate the community on it, we'd be happy to have you back. Absolutely, really appreciate your coming. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Tim. Really appreciate it. I'm Kevin McDonald. You've been watching Facets TV, and with us has been Timothy Jamal, the president of the South Orange County Community College District and the founder and president of Jamal Public Affairs. Thanks for watching. <laughs>